Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to do some videos in preparation for the upcoming debate between Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek. And I will be live streaming with Alan Lee later today, um, uh, later in the evening India time today. W on the topic of Jordan Peterson, I guess losing an award that was given to him recently because of a controversial photo that has uh, surfaced online and that'll be a great talk with Alan and I will be uh, doing videos on uh, 12 rules for life and maps of meaning by Jordan Peterson but I also wanted to talk about Zizek because I think that both of these guys deserve if at all possible equal time leading up to the debate um, since you know they really are both within like I say the top five thinkers of um, uh, top five figures alive today. And I want to uh, focus right now on uh, the philosophy of Slavoj Žižek in his own words, his magnum opus, which is the Parallax View from 2006. And I'll be focusing on the first um, third of that book. So the division of the book um, is that Žižek examines in the first part the ontological parallax, which you find in philosophy. And second, third of the book, he's going to focus on the scientific parallax that you find in, say, quantum physics and neuroscience. And then the third uh, third of the book, he'll focus on the political parallax. And I'll focus on that first part of the book today in which he deals with the problems that have plagued philosophy uh, in Kant, Heidegger, Hegel, German idealism, etc., cetera, um, with a kind of new resource that he has. And that is the notion of parallax. Now, once again, Zizek in 2006, anyway, called Parallax View his own magnum opus. So the casual reader of Zizek who might only read Sublime Object of Ideology or might only read Ticklish Subject um, might be missing out on the fact that at least at this time, Zizek considered this to be the distillation of his thought as a philosopher, more than just as, say, a critic of pop culture or a commentator on political current events on the news, as a philosopher. Zizek's work really can be understood, um, at least at that time, he was arguing, on the basis of the ideas here. And what makes this work different from, say, the sublime object or ticklish subject is that you have this concept of parallax. Now, parallax is something which is ordinarily defined as an apparent displacement of an object caused by a change in observational position that provides a new line of sight. And that's kind of a mouthful in itself. But for Zizek in particular, what interests him about this is that there's a parallax gap which separates these two points for which he's not looking for some synthesis or mediation. He's rather interested in a type of irreducible gap that prevents exactly that type of synthesis. And since it, the levels which you have maybe kind of distinguished there are, are points, are levels that can never actually meet. And it's precisely that which is going to be of philosophical interest to Zizek insofar as he does not use that to take the predictable path of establishing something like a dualism between two coherent or complete perspectives in the idea that the subject would just shuffle between them. It's not that you have this alternation between the diversity of two pre-given fully constituted positivities and the analogy of the image on the screen right now of either is that a vase or is that two faces? It can't be both of them at the same time. It's either one or the other. That's kind of an imperfect analogy. It's one which Zizek mentions himself in the book. And because of its visual simplicity and its universal recognizability, I have included it in this presentation just to give you some idea of what we're looking at here. And yet Zizek is interested in the way that the levels can never actually meet because that's not actually a dualism in which you have two fully constituted positivities that you just alternate from one to the other. Rather, the parallax bracketing itself generates its own object. 
And rather than having the two, you actually just have the gap which separates the one from itself. Now that might sound a little bit abstract, but Zizek provides some actually very good examples of that, which are very uh, difficult to argue with. And he starts, however, by noting that this is not, as concept of parallax, the more um, recognizable new age concept of like the yin yang, which is the idea of a balance within an organic polarity. So the main thing you shouldn't interpret about the parallax for Zizek is that it's, oh, that's just the yin yang and it's just two sides of the same coin, but they're both balanced. That is exactly not what he is interested in. He argues that organic unity is not really that out of which philosophy emerges anyway, not even within the ancient world. He says that the old um, ancient Greek concept of the Greek polis, the the, the Greek city-state, basically, which is balanced and is a type of organic unity, which you find in, say, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit as kind of this first glimpse, which is actually, at, you know, kind of near the beginning of entertaining ideas on this, because it's something that you go beyond, both for Hegel and for Zizek. He says that philosophy doesn't really emerge as much as you might be tempted to think from out of the organic unity of the community. Rather, you only get philosophy, he argues, from the interstices or from the cut that cuts across the community and across communities. And philosophy is therefore something that's actually kind of at odds with the community. He says the same thing about early Christianity. If you have a serious and responsible look at the works of Paul or even Jesus Christ, you don't find the organic Christian community, which is at peace with the surrounding uh, city states. Rather, the idea of the Christian is somebody who is breaking out of those ties by doing things like Jesus says, if anyone doesn't hate mother, brother, sister, father, husband, and wife, they can't join me. And Zizek says there actually is a lot of common ground between Paul and Jesus Christ and and where you get philosophy. So once again, he's not interested in a dualism in which the two are in balance with each other. He's rather interested in how the one has a non-coincidence with itself. The one is not actually, uh, it, it can't actually be itself. And therefore, this is going to be a materialist book that will somehow have to account, especially in part two that deals with neuroscience, about how even human subjectivity does not give you a dualistic transcendental horizon which is above the material. It's rather something which emerges from material explanations that favor the model of non-coincidence, and sorry for all of these crows, if you've ever been to India, you know that there's um, uh, more of them than one person could possibly count. But anyway, he's not, he's interested in how you get subjectivity out of material explanations only because the materialist stance is now one of non-coincidence and incompleteness. And this has to become an ontological principle in the sense that his um, interpretation of dialectic, for example, is that the, um, Explanation for the brain's neuroplasticity is actually a modern scientific example of the old concept of dialectical materialism, and that I'll focus on in the second of the three, uh, once again, the three sections, ontological parallax, that's this video, scientific parallax is the next, and then political parallax. But of course, we're talking in this stage about philosophy and parallax, and of course, the question, uh, what exactly is tickling the ticklish subject? He answers finally as, well, it's the tickling object. And one would say, well, what's that? He says, well, it's the parallax object. And when you're dealing with the object and parallax, he says, have you ever noticed that in psychoanalysis, when an ordinary object is suddenly elevated to the psychoanalytic position of being the object of desire, it's strange that one cannot actually provide a retroactive explanation for why that occurred. You can't actually go back and isolate which one of the properties or attributes of the object accounted for that shift to occur. And in fact, you are misunderstanding the very object itself if you try to do that, because between the ordinary object that you had before and the object of desire that you have later, you don't actually have a dualism between two positivities. You instead have the minimal difference between the one object and itself. And this minimal difference is something that he 
um, is actually going to change his stance with regard to, in a, in a certain sense, Derrida in this um, book, in the sense that in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, a there was a Jacques Derrida fad in the academy, which he had to devote a lot of attention to refuting. He emphasized a lot in, say, Sublime Object of Ideology that that he is not a deconstructive thinker because deconstruction is actually not a critique of all theoretical frameworks. It's actually too theoretical. And he makes that argument in Sublime Object of Ideology. But in this video, actually, um, after the Derrida fad had kind of run its course and become obsolete in the academy, he um, actually kind of changed his view to, rather than devoting that much time to fighting against it, he says, well, actually, Derrida gives us this concept of minimal difference, which within the context of parallax is actually a pretty productive concept. And if you understand it as the non-coincidence of the one object with its Self, which has to be taken account of within this concept of parallax. That's actually something which might sound hopelessly abstract, but there are actually some examples from current events which can demonstrate. For example, in 2001 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, a bunch of protesters were deeply unhappy with the economic policies of the government. So they actually surrounded the building of the economy minister, Cavallo. And because there was so much public outrage against him, it was easy to buy mocking caricature masks of Cavallo's face that were being sold on the streets. And kind of like the way you could probably find a Donald Trump mask today, Cavallo actually bought one himself. And when the protesters surrounded the building, he fled from the building and escaped through the crowds precisely by wearing a mask of himself. In other words, he escaped by being disguised as himself. And the interesting thing there is that the, the minimal difference between Cavallo and himself was what accounted for his ability to escape. Another example is a short story by Henry James in which um, he, a, a painter is looking to find models to paint portraits of aristocrats and decides that to do that, he could use some real aristocrats uh, because what's better than painting the real thing? But he finds that real aristocrats actually make poor models. He found that he had to go to the poor part of town and employ some lower class cockneys to paint the picture correctly. And this idea that the real aristocrat makes a poor model of itself is another example of the minimal difference between the one and itself. And this is also the two maps of the same village in Levi Strauss. If you ask people from one, I guess, class within the village um, to draw a map of the village. They'll draw it a certain way, and people from another class will draw the same uh, uh, village a different way, and neither one of them obviously has it correct. It's not just that one of them is ignorant or willfully malicious. They're both actually, in a certain sense, wrong, uh, just wrong portrayals of the village, but they tell you something, not about the actual positive constitution of the village, but rather about the same inherent antagonism, which is reduplicated in both distortions. And that is what interests him. And he says that this is actually a way to understand the classic philosophers better. His own reading of Kant is that with Kant, the transcendental gap is irreducible to either of the stances of rationalism or empiricism, in the sense that in rationalism, Descartes gives us the cogito as a thinking substance. It's very clear that, well, there's a substance in the sense of God, there's substance in the sense of body, and there's substance in the sense of the thinking thing, which is res cogitans. And in empiricism, David Hume gives us the multitude of fleeting impressions, and he's careful to say that it's like the flowing of a river but only if you accept that as a river with no riverbed. So for David Hume, you have this flow of ideas, but you don't even have a mind which is accepting or underlying those ideas. But Kant really gives us something which is irreducible to either. Um, he gives us self-reflexive unity, which is different from David Hume's fleeting impressions, but he gives us a subject which lacks substance. So this is not Descartes' res cogitans either. Therefore, Kant's eye is neither nominal nor phenomenal, because if it were to appear as an appearance, it would be the nomina appearing to itself. Therefore, Kant, Zizek argues, has to be understood with the notion of parallax. And the transition from Kant to Hegel that uh, Zizek is so famous for in earlier works, therefore, is going to be rethought even by Zizek himself, in the sense that the standard story, if you read like um, Adrian Johnston's book, Zizek's Ontology, is that 
Um, Zizek, uh, uh, interpretation of Hegel is that Hegel ontologized Kant in the sense that um, Kant understood that knowledge was incomplete because it was an epistemological incompleteness with regard to a more or less complete thing in itself on the outside. But for Hegel, you show that there is no complete thing in itself on the outside because the epistemological limitation is actually a sign of an ontological incompleteness. You fail to embody the notion, Zizek argues, because the thing, because reality can't ever be itself. Okay, And here Zizek actually kind of revises his own earlier stance. The argument I just made is kind of more like for they know not what they do um, an early series of lectures. But for here, he says that with Kant, you have negative access to the absolute. Obviously, you you can't access the absolute with your subjective faculties. But with Hegel, you have the absolute itself as a negative. And therefore, the idea that Hegel ontologized Kant by showing that in, uh, epistemological in, uh, incompleteness was not outside a complete thing in itself, um, is reversed in this work, in that Zizek argues that Hegel actually deontologizes Kant, in that he's not only not positing a thing in itself on the outside, but he's also choosing to assert the parallax as such. And he does not overcome the Kantian division, but he instead decides to assert it as such. This is not reconciliation beyond the division. It's rather um, a formal shift with regard to the division insofar as um, the division is already its own reconciliation, as Zizek says. Reconciliation does not move beyond the negative, because reconciliation for Zizek is reconciliation with negativity. And this is what makes Zizek's interpretation of Hegel anyway different from, his, from, from what you find with Spinoza. So Spinoza obviously provides an early parallax in that although he famously says that substance is only one, Spinoza gives us these um, Euclid, Euclidean ge geometry style axioms and definitions for the requirements to be substance. Largely, it's that which needs no other thing to exist. But he says that, you know, if you follow this Euclidean type of methodology and axiomatic system, you'll find that the requirements in Spinoza to be substance are so, uh, are so, so, um, so um, obtuse that there can only be one substance. And yet, with Spinoza, you have one substance and you have mind and body as um, the same substance in two different modes. So Spinoza conceives that mind-body dualism is really just the same substance in two different modes. But for Spinoza, this modalism is more or less symmetric. In fact, it's perfectly symmetric. Um, but for Hegel, you don't have the, the modal um, symmetry that you have in Spinoza. Instead, you have the asymmetric modalism, insofar as Zizek's reading of Hegel is that the two are not a concatenation of one and another one. Two is rather this thing which is, in fact, the very shift from one to two. The other to the one is therefore the gap between the two as such. And therefore, spirit cannot be reduced to any substantial metaphors. Zizek argues that spirit is not this agent which underlies dialectical movement because the spirit is nothing except its own result. And therefore, Hegelian alienation, as Zizek understands it, in which you have this alienation into exteriority that returns into itself as the usual way it's talked about, should not be thought of in substantial metaphors either. The self to which it returns is generated in its very return. And therefore, Hegelian self-consciousness, which you find in, say, the slave-master dialectic, you know, we have this idea in slave-master dialectic that when one self-consciousness encounters another one, it realizes it can feel embarrassment. And it's very difficult to explain why something um, that uh, is, is done maybe in the presence of the other can lead to me being embarrassed is kind of a very informal way of this concept being described. But he says that, uh, Zizek says that the, um, con the concept of self-consciousness has to be rethought in light of the parallax conclusions he's reached here because the self-consciousness is not some obscure and just like mega mind that perceives the all. It's not just that self-consciousness or the ability to be embarrassed by this type of, um, this type of, uh, um, self-consciousness that goes beyond my single mind's consciousness. It's not that that's some obscurantist mega mind that just perceives everything at all times. It's rather just, as he says himself, a non-psychological, self-reflexive registration 
that marks one's position. And the lingering tick that betrays my guilt by notating what took place is actually a better explanation of this than any metaphors of like a, a super consciousness that perceives everything. There was a um, Alfred Hitchcock presents show, for example, about a guy who committed a crime and changed his entire appearance. He put on a perfect um, disguise to hide what he'd done. He commits a murder. And at the very end of the show, he's looking to collect his inheritance because he killed a family member. And the, the police detective um, looks at him and says, I can't believe you. And he says, what are you talking about? I was, uh, I was gone that week and I have a, an alibi. And the, the guy says, I really can't believe you. You have spent your entire life only ever seeing what you want to see. You might have put on a disguise, but you forgot about the mole, a big old mole right on your cheek, which is un, um, uh, unavoidably noticeable. And of course, that lingering excess um, which betrays his guilt is more like self-consciousness uh, in line with um, Zizek's understanding of it anyway than anything like a, a super consciousness. So even in the abs absence of psychological consciousness of it, the guilt of the guy who committed the murder but failed to cover up the mole, which he was not psychologically aware of, it's been noted out there in the open. And he notes that with Ingmar Bergman and Fellini, you see this shift towards the end in which rather than have the type of spontaneous creativity that marked the brilliance of their their them at their peak, you instead, Ingmar Bergman remarks, at the end of his career, Fellini was making Fellini films. He started imitating himself and following his own formula. Um, and Ingmar Bergman fell into the same problem because Ingmar Bergman's later film, Autumn Sonata, really failed as a film. And there's something about that film, which even if you're a fan of him, it, it kind of rubs you the wrong way because that was Bergman trying to make a Bergman film. And Shishik says these are self-conscious films rather than spontaneous creativity. They started following their own formula as a non-psychological registration. And... Chapter two moves on to talk about building blocks for materialist theology by focusing in, in a certain sense, the whole thing is kind of about Kierkegaard. I mean, it's about a lot of other things, obviously, but Kierkegaard's a big part of it because although Kierkegaard is usually portrayed as the greatest enemy of German idealism, the two are actually a lot closer than you would expect. And the things about Kierkegaard, which Zizek finds really interesting, are things that um, ultimately overlap with a lot of the German idealism, which Zizek finds interesting. For example, um, Kierkegaard's critique of Hegel is that he's a philosopher for whom everything has already happened. And if you have this understanding of dialectical movement as a, like a predetermined system, which just actualizes potentialities in this Aristotelian sense, as he would, um, he, he critiques it here, and it becomes much more explicitly critiqued in the 2012 book, Less Than Nothing. Um, that's the kind of assumption about Hegel, which Kierkegaard has. And Kierkegaard says this is problematic on an existential level, because the openness to the future is actually a very big part of existentialism, which cannot just be reduced to the system actualizing itself. But what if Zizek argues Hegel is actually more interested in finding the potential in the actual, insofar as within any naive actuality, she, uh, Hegel shows that you can actually find a striving towards potentiality. Therefore, the Kierkegaardian infinite resignation is um, something which also has to be understood through negativity, which is precisely what German idealism gives you in the sense that Kierkegaardian um, infinite res resignation is an act with no content. Its meaning can only be purely negative, and therefore, the fall into sin in concept of anxiety is, would, would come to be uh, rethought in a uh, uh, 2014 book, uh, Absolute Recoil in Greater Detail, is also purely formal because you have this fall into sin with Adam, but that's the second fall after, excuse me, it's not a second fall after the fall into dizziness of existential freedom. Rather, you have just the fall of existential freedom which you have a perspectival shift as that which separates um, it from this other concept of a fall into sin with Adam. Therefore, Kierkegaard gives you something that has to be thought of in the resources of parallax. It's all too easy to miss, for example, that even though Kierkegaard presents something of a triad with the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious, he's actually always just caught up in only the parallax of the two. 
for example, in either or, you have really the aesthetic and the ethical, but you don't have any mediation. You have no clean passage in Kierkegaard from the aesthetic to the ethical. You can only really move within Kierkegaard's triad through making these huge leaps. And the religious itself should not be seen as a synthesis of the two, but rather as the assertion of the parallax gap as such. This explains Kierkegaard's own implicit obsession with, with uh, paradox. Um, for him, religious absurdity, for example, the question, if God is um, omnipotent, is he powerful enough to build a boulder so large that even he cannot lift it? That's the type of thing which Kierkegaard says does not actually bother him, because one can only understand a figure like Jesus if you use paradox. In fact, if you miss out on that fact, you're actually failing to contemplate Christianity as such. The problem with a lot of the establishment Christians of his era, would they actually fallen away from Christianity by missing out on the paradox of it. Therefore, the parallax is itself caught up in another parallax in which even when ex if one accepts Kierkegaard's position, one is condemned either to perpetual anxiety or one can only um, move to something else by embracing the comical. And Shishik's stance is that the Gnostic Christian's serious ascent up to higher wisdom is precisely somebody who's missed the joke of Christianity, just like Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, is a film which is completely lacking in humor and missing the point which uh, Kierkegaard was able to see. Therefore, he's focusing on how evil is going to mean something other even than what George Lucas thought it meant in his own critique of his film, Star Wars Episode Three: The Revenge of the Sith. One of the more interesting parts of this book, by the way. He says, in shelling German idealism, evil is just the actualization of what should remain potential. And it should remain potential because it's grounding in the background. And if you actualize that, you have a very big problem. And Star Wars Episode Three is something which... You've, which fails precisely by taking this type of silly pseudo-Buddhist explanation for Anakin's fall into the dark side. Um, in other words, the explanation George Lucas gives himself for how Anakin became evil does not go along with the shelling stance towards evil, but instead goes into the pseudo-Buddhist explanation in which George Lucas, in one um, interview uh, speaking about this film, itself said, you know, Anakin Skywalker turned into Darth Vader because he got too attached to things. You know, he couldn't let go of his mother. He couldn't let go of his girlfriend. And that made him greedy. And by being susceptible to uh, this willingness to cross over into evil in order to avoid losing things he's been attached to, that's how he actually became Darth Vader. And Shishak argues that episode three is a failure because the way that it should have run was Anakin crossing into evil precisely by fighting too hard for the good and ending up actualizing the secure grounding of the potential into evil. But instead, Anakin just kind of wavers and gets seduced a little bit at a time by Darth, Darth Sidious and um, the Emperor Palpatine kind of talks him into becoming evil for you know, fairly, um, uh, fairly trivial self-interested reasons. And of course, um, he ends up, uh, with the self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that what he was afraid of happening could have been avoided if he had just not become evil. But anyway, I won't spoil too much of the film, but uh, I is interested in how in Star Wars, you have the individual reading of Anakin Skywalker, which is quite interesting, but you also have the political reading and the political reading is also conflicted in that Star Wars is such a fascinating universe precisely because there's an ambiguity in the political readings, which cannot be reduced to just one meaning. For example, in Star Wars, the shift from the Republic to the evil empire, which you see in um, Star Wars Episode 3, in which you kind of find a moment that you suddenly wake up and find that the Republic has actually become the Empire. But this can be equally legitimately read through, say, the lens of the, um, you know, Marine Le Pen, um, or what is that guy, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, um, in France with uh, Front National, and um, Pat Buchanan in the United States, and arguably uh, Boris uh, Johnson in um and, uh, and UKIP in the UK, which is the retreat of the nation state out of imperial global involvements, um, which is uh, one interpretation of 
the shift from the Republic to the Empire is, you know, if we want to get the Republic back, we kind of got to retreat out of these globalist imperial involvements is the argument. But then again, you also have the political reading of the contradiction of nobles fighting for the Democratic Republic against the Empire in that in Star Wars Episode Five, precisely the Princess Leia and the Jedi Knighthood are fighting to restore the Democratic Republic against the Empire, and there is something of a political con contradiction there. Of course, then there's also the reading, uh, the Empire emerged from out of the Republic, precisely in fighting to try to secure itself as a Republic. And he says that, you know, the USA's war on terror, in which, you know, George Bush and then Obama, and then it continues under Trump, there are people who are saying, you know, we're fighting uh, the Taliban and we're fighting, um, you know, uh, Al Qaeda and we're fighting, um, you know, Saddam Hussein, even though he had nothing actually to do with uh, the the uh, uh, terror groups like Al Qaeda, which uh, they claim were responsible for 9-11. Um, but they say that, you know, we're fighting these guys because we want democracy to live. We, we're defending the Republic precisely by turning into the type of global empire that is uh, inflicting destruction over um, many years. But of course, <laughs> as controversial as these waters are to tread, um, it's it's something which you kind of read in the, um, uh, the reading of Star Wars as well, in the sense that the empire emerged out of the Republic similarly. But the thing is, no one of those is actually the only correct one. And therefore, Darth Vader, as the only real subject in the book, if you look closely at the kind of universe that is the Star Wars universe, it's fascinating because it's basically a new age pagan universe. And if you have this new age pagan universe of balance, the most scandalous thing that could happen is the birth of Christ. Because once again, Christianity is the antithesis of the organic balanced pagan uh, Greek city-state. Um, and that's basically what Anakin Skywalker is. Anakin Skywalker is basically the birth of Christ in the pagan New Age universe because we learn in episode one that his mother basically conceived him miraculously the way that Mary conceived Christ. And that pod racing is his um, obvious parallel to the kind of chariot racing that you find in Ben-Hur. However, it's too easy to misinterpret his precise um, subjectivity within the... Um, Star Wars universe in the sense that he's arguably the only subject, but that's not negated by his final refusal when Obi-Wan offers to him to return to the good side after he had already been badly injured and it seemed like he didn't have much to gain at a material or uh, subjective, um, I, that's the wrong word, a self-interested, that's a better word, um, uh, um, uh, from a self-interested perspective. He didn't have that much to gain from clinging to evil. In fact, it was just certain that he was going to be injured to the point that he'd have to become a cyborg. Um, but even in the absence of any teleological orientation towards self-gain, he maintains a position. And he maintains it in a way that has to be thought of as Zizek's sense of ethical. And even um, <clears throat> after he is uh, retrofitted with lots of, lots of machine stuff, he remains the only subject. The irony about Darth Vader in Star Wars is that the guy who... Who, uh, whose own voice is basically that of a machine, like you hear his breathing on the inside, it's basically the labored breathing of a machine. He's actually the only subject, and at the end when he finally takes off the mask and you find this uh, crotchety old man behind the uh, most dangerous villain in the Star Wars universe, he's actually giving up his subjectivity. And ironically enough, it's precisely after he's no longer the machine-voiced a man that he's no longer the real subject. Before he closes with talking about Levinas and ethics and Heidegger and finitude as having to be interpreted some way other than how it normally would be, in the sense that, you know, we, we normally think in Levinasian ethics in which the recognition of the human in the face of the other is the basis of ethics. Satisfactory explanation, um, but uh, Zizek is interested in the way that that actually misses the problem of the inhuman excess in the other. And the parallax that interests Zizek in this regard is not between human and animal. 
Um, it's rather between human and the inhuman excess, which is not the excess of some extrinsic being. It rather is the inhuman within the human, which Levinas misses out on. And this is something you also lose with too much of an emphasis on finitude. He says that Heidegger's emphasis on finitude, which is accepting the contingency of our, the thrownness of our situation, rejecting big metaphysical explanations, that also misses out on the inhuman dimension, be in that Heidegger has no way to account for the undead spectral object, as he usually calls it. And he says this is, of course, paired with the fact that Heidegger, the greatest philosopher of finitude, is also the, the philosopher most lacking in sense of humor. And he says there's, it's not that this undead object is something with no position in the matrix of acceptable structural locations. This is another theme in 2014 um, Absolute Recall, such that if you were just to add another empty place for it, um, if, you were, if you were to add a place for it within the matrix, even an empty place as such, it's not that you could resolve the problem of the excess of the undead, because even if you added an empty place within the matrix as such, the empty place within the matrix would be the same front to the back of the undead object. That would be front and back of the same object, in other words. And therefore, it's not a remainder which castration misses symbolically if you go into like psychoanalysis. It's rather the product of castration itself. You're misunderstanding the origin of this excess if you miss out on that fact. And I'll just go ahead and check the comments right now. And uh, once again, live streaming with Alan Lee later today. Excess if you miss out on that. And let me see if there's any comments. Yeah, sorry for the crows. Thank God for no Star Wars spoilers. I heard something bad happens to Boba Fett at some point. I can't wait to watch it. Um, yeah, it's definitely it's like it's a good movie. Um, it's a good set of movies. I haven't really bought into the uh, the latest um, you know hype with. Uh, I remember there was an article in the news like uh, you know last year, the end of the year, about how. Um, releasing a Star Wars movie was a really big deal in, say, 2000 when they released um, uh, Episode One. I mean, it was a really big deal. There was a film called uh, Fanboys where uh, the, it's a fictional portrayal of uh, a couple of Star Wars um, geeks, for lack of a better word, driving across the country to, to break into George Lucas's house to try to watch Episode One um, before it comes out. And at the end of the film, they stop and say, wait a minute, what if it sucks? And I mean, it was a really big film at that time, but I mean, there was a new Star Wars film like last week, I mean, excuse me, last year, and I didn't even know about it until I saw an article saying that it was a flop because nobody watched it because they've actually over done the Star Wars hype to try to make money. It's the same thing with uh, Peter Jackson and um, um, Lord of the Rings. Like uh, it, was, it was fitting to have like a nine hour trilogy of the entire Lord of the Rings series, but it, was, it was really was overkill to try to do The Hobbit as a nine hour long film. I didn't even watch longer than the first. I boycotted after the, the first installment of The Hobbit. But uh, at any rate, uh, thanks for watching and uh, next video will be a live stream with Alan Lee on Jordan Peterson getting an award rescinded because of a controversial photo. And uh, philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, anti-tech revolution coming next. Thank you.